Welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. I'm Joshua Stike along with Luke Agri. And today we have two guests yeah, two on the podcast. Guests. And before we before you kind of give a little teaser here, I am going to make a change, an edit to our intro because I actually Uh-oh. messed up. I said that one of our guests uh, had 28 franchises with 460 agents, actually 46 hundred agents. So this podcast is going to be a lot about leadership, yeah. man. Yeah. It's actually unreal. Like I, we were listening to them at the end, you know, I said to Josh after we got off is literally like, wow, like you would want to work for people like that. Uh, just because of, you can see just the style and their attitude towards leadership and all of the things that they've done and still that humbleness, like yeah. they've accomplished so yeah. much, so much humbleness there. Like, it's amazing. I can't wait for you guys to hear everything they talk about. Absolutely. But before we introduce those two, we would love it if you take a minute to subscribe to stay paid on Apple podcasts or Spotify. If you're not already subscribed and while you're there, drop us a review to let us know how we're doing. We'll read it here on the show. This actually comes from one of our YouTube comments. So this was episode two. 47 with Gus Munoz Castro. This was all about converting Facebook leads. This was the power ISA guy. Uh, but Davy Dog, what's happening in real estate? I love Davy Dog. Davy Dog, shout out. You always leave comments on our YouTube love you, videos. Davey Dog. This one, he goes so great. When I was a kid, Sunday nights meant wonderful world of Disney. Now it means wonderful world of stay paid because we always <laughs> drop our interviews on Sunday night. Also, he gives me a little dig here. Nice of Josh to wear his grandmother's throwback shirt to bring me back to the <laughs> 70s. LOL. I actually wore that shirt yesterday for so all good. of our podcast recordings. It's like a blue shirt with little white dots. I appreciate that. I always, I always was a child of the 70s, I believe, in spirit. My favorite podcast, he says, in so many ways. Ways. Thank you so much, Davey Dog, for leaving that comment on our YouTube video. If you want to leave us a review, head on over to Apple Podcasts. We'll make sure to read it here on the show. And now let's get into this week's interview. From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Our guests today are Linda McKissick and Dana Gentry. They are the host of Everything Life and Real Estate Podcast. Linda began her career in the mid-80s and quickly became one of the top sales professionals for Keller Williams International, purchasing her first KW franchise in 1960 or 1996. Excuse me. In There's Denton, a lot of Texas. dates there, you know. I know. I'm telling you, when I was going through and setting up their bio, I'm just going <laughs> to interrupt right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, what these two you have, have accomplished. You have the hardest job, which is <laughs> the, the bio reading. It's always hard. Oh my gosh. Since then, Linda has built a region with 28 franchises, 460 agents, as in still growing year after year. Along with her husband, Jim, she's the author of the national best-selling book as well, Hold, How to Find, Buy, and Rent Houses for Wealth. So that's just one of our guests. Our second guest, Dana, she's a real estate vet of 15 years in Central Kentucky, where her team, Real Estate Partners 360, continues to serve. After stepping out of actively selling in 2015, Dana became a black belt team leader and is currently the operating principal of Keller Williams Legacy Group, Keller Williams Consultants Realty, Ooh. and Keller Williams Realty Consultants, Linda and Dana. Whew, welcome to the podcast. Could you, you have read Linda's second, mine first? I never like to follow Linda. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't think you have anything to worry about there. Look at where you are, Dana, at your age. You are way far ahead. <laughs> I love it. Now, love it. We are super excited to really pick you guys' brains on all things business, leadership, sales, marketing. Want to start off, though, by having you guys share, obviously, really incredible careers. Spent a lot of time in real estate, building out business. But want to talk about your podcast, Everything Life in Real Estate. What led you guys to starting that? What is it all about? Uh, tell us a little bit about the background there and what you're trying to accomplish. Well, pretty much it's everything about what Dana and I want to talk about. (laughs) We kind of selfishly started it because we were both so busy. We never had time to talk to each other. (laughs) And we love talking to each other because we're like minds. We want to accomplish the same big goals. Uh, And to be honest with you, we also wanted to attract, you know, our who we wanted to be a hero to and who we wanted to bring into our world that we enjoy, that give us energy and motivate us. And so we thought the best way to do that would be just to start having an open conversation about the topics that we love and see who came on board with us. How many years have you guys been at it now? Almost two. Almost two. (laughs) 
Because yeah. I know the, it's, no- it's the one thing we've both been consistent with. <laughs> we've been very consistent with it. I would add to what Linda said too. Um, having Linda's studied under John Maxwell for many, many years. I've had the honor for the last couple of years. Love and him. one thing that John says is he wakes up every day to just add value to other people. And through the podcast, we get to add value to other people that we might not get to be in communication with every single day. But through the reach of the podcast, just like you guys, you get to add value to so many more people. It is amazing. The number one killer podcast is like pod fade, right? So people start them out. And I think, what is yep. it? 10 episodes? I think it's to? like something like eight or 10 episodes yeah, eight or, or an average lifespan of a podcast. And, and you keep going. So making it two years, I think we are what now on three years for this show. Yeah. We just went yeah. past three. Which yeah. is, it's in so January. interesting, the journey. I'm sure you guys can relate. At first you're just, you know, you're having a convo and your, your, your family is it's, listening to you it's and, easy and maybe to come some up friends. With stuff, and then all of a sudden people start listening. And you're like, man, I got to actually think about what I say. <laughs> and then you go, wait, that makes the show terrible. I actually shouldn't think about what I'm saying. I should just do We don't do ever me. listen to our episodes. <laughs> you never listen? We never listen. Oh, no. wow. I can relate to that because there have been times over the three years of doing this where I've stopped listening to it because it just gets in my head. But then I go back to it. I'm like, ah, oh, I got to analyze this. Uh, I did this wrong. Josh always knows I come in and I go, we got to do this better. We got <laughs> we don't interview well here. So no, that's awesome. I love that. So, you know, we want to kind of go down this road of, you know, leadership and you guys obviously have a lot of people that report up to you and that you're responsible for. So we'd love to pick your brain. I was telling Josh, on this idea of fierce conversations, because one of the topics that you said you would love to talk about is this concept of fierce conversations. And I'd love for you to explain what does that mean to you having fierce conversations and why is it important? Um, Well, honestly, fierce conversations sound scary and awful, but the reality is, is if you're going to lead people, one of the greatest gifts you can give them is the truth. Uh, whatever that is. And if you genuinely care about people and you're not trying to just like succeed around them, one of the components that Dana and I both are very adamant about is that, you know, if a behavior needs to change, most people would tell you on a scale of one to 10, they would like you to be 10 honest with them. And yet we're not most of our time being 10 honest with other people. Right. And so we see fierce conversations as something that can be a relationship enriching, not something that tears it down. And we, you know, we just, we both feel very adamant about it's not fun and it's not comfortable, but practicing and learning and teaching it and doing all the things you have to do to, to master those kind of things. If you're going to be a leader is super important. You know, Linda teaches fierce conversations and I love one of the things that she says of why she taught it is because the best way to learn something is force yourself to go teach it. And that's (laughs) how quickly how you learn it. And Linda, you have funny stories about people who have taken fierce conversations and the things that they've done. People gotten divorced and changed their whole lives and their businesses and all these things. But the reality is that if you when I stepped into being a leader, I had never led anybody but myself and was in my early twenties. And so having fierce conversations was very scary to me. Mm. Uh, And I remember the first time I actually took a fierce conversations course, I was like, man, this is so freeing. And you can think of all these people that you want to have conversation or that you need to have conversations (laughs) with. uh, That you haven't in the past, but really as you begin to walk down a leadership path, I tell Linda now it's like, Oh, just had another fierce conversation. Oh, nope. Had another one yesterday because it they happen and you have to. And if you want to grow and you're committed to the growth of the people that you lead, then you have to be able to have conversations with them. And still there are times where it's not comfortable. Mm. Um, and I have to, you know, Linda will give me a pep talk or somebody else will right before, or I've got my notes out. But the reality is that it, it always helps them. And Linda, what is it? The conversation is the relationship. Yeah. So if it's muted or there's all these lists of things you can't talk about, then that's defines your relationship. Mm. You know, I, a lot of times when I, when I talk about that part, men will want to leave the room and go call home for some reason. I'm not sure why, but uh, apparently they, they realize that they've been avoiding conversations that really make the relationship and we all do it, but yeah, it's a, uh, you know, and the, the more you agree that you're going to lead people and succeed through people and you care about those people and you're not just trying to use them as something you succeed around, then you kind of you'd be better off to have a model and a system to when those times come up, because it's not 
when it's not, if they come up, it's when they come up, when, when the opportunity is there. Yeah. I think so, so often going into one of those conversations, that's a crucial or fierce conversation. It's like, you get so nervous because you don't know what to say or how to approach it. So is there a framework or you mentioned a model? Is there sort of like a step-by-step process? Cause I think anytime you can do that, it sort of removes some of the emotion and allows you to have something to follow. Is there something there that you teach? Yeah, matter of fact, we just did this. Dana and I do a leadership academy with in, inside of our region. We have about 4,600 agents in that region. And so what we're trying to find is who are the future leaders that are raising their hands saying, where's mine? What's next? Right. Mm-hmm. Like Dana and I have. And so this is we taught the confront conversation. And that's what that one's called when you want to change someone's behavior. And I think the the biggest key elements of that framework is one for you to get clarity because a lot of times there's so much emotion around the conversation that's been needed to be had could be years. You haven't had the conversation, right? Mm. You had it in your head and it didn't quite go the way you thought it was going to go, or you rehearse how you think they're going to respond and they don't respond that way at all. And so having that framework just gives you a place to bring them back to because they're going to want to go off into bunny trail and escape also, because it's also uncomfortable for them when they realize in that 60 seconds that you're, about to talk to confront them about something. So it's pretty much, you know, getting clear before you go into that conversation and a great book by Susan Scott is called fierce conversations. And I think confront is actually in there, but you know, the other piece that I've found super helpful is to learn how to view what their, their behavior has been like you were looking through a video camera, you know, and take all the emotional words out, you know, Hmm. uh, you know, don't blame and don't talk down those kind of things. So learning how to take all your emotion out so that you're real clear and concise. And by the time you get through with that 60 minute presentation to them and then ask them to, from where they sit, what do they see? You've been very clear. And so they don't have a doubt of, you know, I'm getting a raise or, you know, or, Mm. you know, she loves me and we're just going to talk about how, how great I am with the company. We're real clear that we've had some behavior stuff that has to be changed. And I think that's the, the main part. So we tell in the class to, you know, to, to go practice it with other people because you're in the middle of the weeds a lot of times. And there's, you know, a lot of, you know, you've got some things at stake if it doesn't go well, they've got some things at stake. So I would say the model is presenting your 30, your 62nd, you know, I want to talk with you about X, the the effect X is having on Y, if you will. And then just real clear examples, one to three, very clear examples. And then, and then of course, asking them from, you know, what, what's going on. And then of course, they're going to want to deny, defend or deflect. So we got to bring them back to know this is what we're here to talk about. And I just think it's probably one of the best. I mean, the minute I heard Susan Scott, she was at our family reunion years ago. I immediately thought of a conversation, went to my room, devoured her book, practiced the conversation. And as bad as I was, it still worked very effectively. So I thought, man, I'm going to master this stuff because you could, everybody needs this. And, you know, I always tell Dana, I take someone that I really care about every time I teach it. I'll take a family member, a friend, someone, because I think it's such a gift to give people mm. I, I couldn't agree more. It's like what we have found over the years with um, our company, Reminder Media, and our leaders, it's the lack of clarity. What happens is you're so focused on making sure the you don't hurt the person's feelings. So I loved how you mentioned the example of make sure they don't think they're getting a pay raise. But it sounds hilarious, but we've had like team leaders go in, have combos with their people And it's supposed to be a serious like, hey, I'm confronting you on these behavioral issues or performance issues. And the person walks out thinking they have done, you know, well, that's one thing they have to focus on. But everything else they're doing is is phenomenal. And because I think, um, you know, they call it, I think, sometimes the kick ass sandwich. Um, And I think a lot of leaders, have you heard about this, where it's like you compliment them, then you kick them in the ass, then you compliment them. But I think that adds a lot of confusion. I think that it, it, over the years of me doing this, so I love your point on clarity and making it so you know, like beyond a shadow that that person leaves. I always, what I've done, and I don't know what you think about this, is at the end, I almost do what's called like a clarity exercise. I think I got it from Patrick Leosoni, um, mm-hmm. a guy who wrote the yeah. uh, book Advantage and stuff, is making sure, hey, let's just recap, you know, what did you hear as your action items taken away from this? And I'll then repeat back what I think. But I first let them share what they have heard, because if you tell them what you've heard, then they're going to just regurgitate that. 
to you from an actual leadership side. So you obviously have so many people reporting to you, fierce conversations, other leadership um, principles. I'm very curious because in your model, the agents don't really work for you, right? They're 1099s. So how do you motivate, how do you confront and also motivate people who technically are supposed to be their own boss? That seems like it would be an extra challenge. Um, How do you go about motivating your salespeople to achieve and, and get them out of the slumps and stuff like that? Go ahead, Dana. I'll let you start with this one. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think the biggest thing, the first thing I thought of when you just asked that question is you really have to listen, (laughs) which for a lot of leaders is hard to do. And there's something that is a a skill that they have to master over many, many years. Um, Because ultimately, you're right, their agents are 1099. We can't tell them what to do. A lot of times someone told me, I don't know if what quote this is, but that the hardest thing about being a leader is you want it more for them than they want it for themselves. Mm. (laughs) And so a lot of times you have to really listen to see what it is that they want, because I just had a conversation even this morning with an agent and she's a rock star. And she said, money doesn't motivate me, Mm. Um, which I a little bit struggle with sometimes with people that say that because I live by the John Maxwell quote, um, you can't be outrageously generous if you're broke. (laughs) So (laughs) I like to be generous. And and in order to do that, you can't be broke. So money does motivate me. So when I was talking to her, I was really finding myself having to listen and ask her great questions because at the end of the day, I think if you're going to motivate these people who are self-employed and they run their own businesses, you have to listen and figure out what is it that they, their goal is, what do they ultimately want to get out of the business that they have, or that they're trying to grow. Some people want to sell 10 houses a year and they're good with it. Other people want to sell 10,000 houses a year and have the biggest and best life that they can. And I think you have to get great at listening and you have to get great at asking great questions. Um, one thing Linda taught me and Linda, you may talk about this is None of us are good enough to make any buyer buy or any seller sell or any agent come to your company or anything that you want to do. They're only going to do it when they self-discover and people only self-discover three ways through great questions, stories, or experiences. Mm. And that's probably been one of the biggest lessons that Linda has ever taught me. And I use it on the daily um, because you have to get great at asking great questions and then figuring out how you can show them stories or take them to experiences or whatever to really push them through when you want to motivate people to reach whatever it is that they want to reach. Yeah, I would agree. You know, we have a process uh, called get the book on someone. And if they're in our leadership role, it's super important uh, to, or if you're going to coach them, it's super important to get real clear about um, where do they want to be in five years? Where do they want to be in three years? Because if I don't know that, you know, and I don't check back on a regular basis to make sure we always say talent only leaves when there's no more opportunity. You know, they're Mm. truly motivated and talented people. They're going to look up and if the spot they want is yours and you're not moving, they're leaving. They're going to go do what you do. Right. But if you can help them see a path and, and show them that together we can get you where you want to go and you just focus on that you don't have to worry about what your, your goals are. If you get the right people and they've got big enough goals, their goals will push you to get your goals. And so I think, uh, as leaders, I'm, and a lot of times I'll, well, I'll have agents come to me and they'll be so distraught that their key person left and they won't have a clue where that person wanted to be in three to five years. They will, will have never had that conversation. And so learning that talent only leaves when they look up and think there's no place else to go and they want to do more. They want to be you. You want them to want to be you, right? I want Dana to want to do and accomplish what I've accomplished because I can help her do that inside my world, mm. right? So I think that's the, the, that's the thing. The one, you got to get motivated people, you know, right. You can't motivate somebody that that doesn't have big dreams and big goals uh, for themselves or whatever their goals are to them. They're their goals, but you got to get clarity around that. And you got to have some process just like you have a process for fierce conversations. You have a process for that also. Yeah, no, I love the, um, where do you want to be in three? I used to not ask that with, with people because I thought it felt, cheesy or cliche like well you know it's the common job interview question where do you see yourself in five years we get that question where do you see reminder media in five years but i've been doing it more lately uh from a from more of a personal sort of motivation standpoint not from like oh i want to be this job title or something like that and it really has revealed a ton from what people are sort of wanting to achieve and it doesn't necessarily mean it's in that specific path there might be another path or another opportunity 
out there for them. Well, the way you make that be more authentic is this truly is what you do. I yeah. truly am trying to figure out where that person wants to go. Right. I'm not following a process just for the process sake. I really need to know if wherever Dana wants to go, my vehicle is going to get her there. Mm. Right. And if it's not, I want to know on the front end, I don't want to know on the back end. Right. And so I think, you know, one, when we, when it's authentically part of how we build our world, that's when it becomes a little less, I feel like I'm, you know, and the more you do it, of course, right. Uh, it is the one thing. If you're going to be a leader and build an organization, it is your one thing. Mm. Yeah. Finding talent, interviewing talent, you know, hiring talent, all those things and never stopping. Even if you think you have all the spots filled, because what if there's this one amazing person that could do, take you somewhere that you're not even thinking about taking. And so I think the more you do it, and then also truly, it is truly part of how you're going to build your world is I got to know where do they want to be in three to five years? Cause if my vehicle, and we've done this process before and found out somebody would rather be in the mission field. Fantastic. God's a much better recruiter than I am. So <laughs> I try, But I would rather know that before I invest time and energy and resources into that person and help them get there quicker. That is so good. What's your favorite you know, uh, interview? Oh, I'm sorry, Dana, go ahead. I was just going to say really quick one thing. Um, instead of what part of our process is not just like, where do you want to be with this company in three years or five years? It's where do you want to be in your job, in your money life and in your yeah. home life or your family life? And, and we break it into four kind of quadrants. And then is there anything else that's important to you? And people will say, I want to have 10 rental properties and I want to have them all paid or I want to have my house paid off and I want to be making X amount passive and X amount um, you know, through my uh, vertical or whatever it is that they're doing. And then they'll say, and I really want to get to take two vacations a year, or I really want to get to not work during the month of December, which is my goal. Like it's, what do you, what are those things that you want to be able to get to outside of just where do you see yourself in this company in the next three to five years? So much clarity. That is so good. So much clarity there. I love the four quadrants. Yeah. Well, I was also going to say like what I have found, which I think, you know, I want the audience to get is like, People really succeed when they're living a life of purpose. When you, when you, and it, it doesn't mean there's an exact purpose, right? It's them living their purpose and what they are going after and stuff. But living a life of purpose um, is really, really important versus just living a transactional based life. Um, so I love that in the clarity. You were going to ask an interview question. Well, I have to I'm jump back because we, we just, you mentioned interviewing and finding talent and everything. We just recorded a podcast where Luke gave his four best sales interview questions. What's your favorite question to ask on an interview to get that little bit of information out of a potential candidate or a potential hire that gives you, you know, some sort of indication of where their motivation or where their success might lie? Linda, I got to, sh- I got to share that. Okay. Since Luke mentioned Patrick Lencioni, we love him. We met him in San Francisco. Uh, was, I think it was Sam. I don't know. Maybe I can't remember where it was. We met him somewhere. And, um, and so one of the things that he taught, and it's not necessarily an interview question, but it's an interview exercise. And I've used it many times and actually love it. Um, you know, he does the humble, hungry, smart. So whenever he's looking for talent, they have to be humble first and foremost, if they're not humble, then he, he doesn't want to be in business with them. Um, hungry, they have to be hardworking and then smart. They have to have emotional intelligence, not, he doesn't care about their IQ. Mm. He wants to know that they can connect with people and that they can be relational. And so he said, one of his favorite things to do in an interview process is he takes them to lunch or breakfast or dinner or whatever it is, but he gets there about 15 minutes before. And he tells the server to mess up their order. <laughs> and he wants to see how they're going to react yeah. to them messing up their order. And he said he's religiously done it for years. Um, and I don't know where he got it from, but I have stolen that many times. Have you? And yes. What's and the best story see, there? What's the best story? <laughs> well, one one guy. Well, most of the time they, they're very gracious. You okay. know, it's it's always been good. But I did have one guy out of one, out of one of my offices who really was kind of rude and nasty. And instantly I just was like, Oh, I don't know. I don't, that's not somebody I want to be in business with, but it is a good wow. test to be able to see. So I don't know. That's a good funny story and something that might be helpful to somebody else. Not necessarily a question, but you see somebody's true colors when they're in an environment that they can't control or something happens and you see really how they treat people, um, which to me is the most important. Hmm. 
True. There, and I would like to ask, you were born and then what happened? Yeah, I love that. The zebras don't change their stripe. Um, if, if someone, you know, goes through adversity and they come out the other side strong, if they have victim language that tells you something, you know, usually their journey from where they were to now will tell you a lot about what their journey might be like from where you are and you want to go with them. So besides the, you know, the, what we call the question, the motivation question of where do you want to be in, in five years? I would say the other one is just, you were born and then what happened? And then just listen very carefully. What's their language? Is it victim? Is it accountable? Is it humble? You know, like Dana said, you use a very similar one. With yeah, very story. similar, yeah. Of, you know, sharing your life story and understanding. It's literally what you're saying. It's like how someone talks about their life, how they yeah. talk about what they've done, what they've overcome. You get a, you get insight into uh, really what they value, what they yeah. see as a real, like I always preface it to, and yeah, tell me about your accomplishments too, because I want to see what they think is an accomplishment or they think what I think I want to hear is an accomplishment or something. So, you know, it's very interesting what you can get out of that with people. There was a, I can't remember if it was the Starbucks uh, CEO, but he would do a similar thing where he would take the uh, person to the actual like Starbucks locations. And he specifically did that to watch how they would interact with all the staff, how they would actually point out things if they would stop and pick up trash, if they wouldn't. Like he was looking for all these, in a way, tangible, but they're intangibles of like, it's just built into a person's character, who they are. They they don't, you know, kind of, they're, they're nice to the person naturally because it's who their character is versus, you know, being super very structured or something like that. Luke, you just reminded me to, of world two things. Um, one, I think it's Andy Stanley that says people admire you for your success, but they connect with you through your failures and or your weaknesses. And I remember a lot of times John Maxwell would say he would ask somebody what their greatest failure has been or a couple of their failures. And if they can't think of anything, <laughs> then that's a, like a cue right off the bat. Delusion. Um, yeah. <laughs> delusion or maybe they're not humble or yeah, they're maybe they really haven't had as much success as we thought they've had if they haven't had any failures along the way. Um, and then the second thing I thought of was Linda and I learned from Gary Keller, the barbecue test. (laughs) Linda, do you want to tell them about the barbecue test? Yeah, actually, well, there was, he has 10 steps, but I added an extra one called the barbecue test because if they pass all 10 and I still wouldn't want to hang out with them at a barbecue, then they're not going to get into my world because (laughs) I love that. You no, know, because you got to you want to you want to be able to want to spend time with these people. You don't, you know you don't want to say, well, they're here to do a job, and that's all. Because your lives get intertwined, right? And so I want to wake up and be with people that I know that are laying awake worrying about me, like I'm laying awake at night worrying about them. So he he has a ten step process that he's taught us over these years. That by the way, you know, has been worth millions to us. And then, and then I said, yeah, there's one more though. If I really wouldn't want to hang out with them or spend time with them at a barbecue, I don't really want, I don't want to bring them into my world. Yeah. That's so good. We call that the beer test here. We've, yeah. we've done the <laughs> similar things where we go, if you don't want to go have a beer with the person. We're from the North. Yeah. yeah. So it's the beer test. <laughs> it's really the beer. Like barbecue. So or I'm the not really sure why. Test. <laughs> yeah. Got it pretend you like barbecue. (laughs) I love it. Well, let's pivot here um, because you have a lot of wisdom, both of you and knowledge on building a business, specifically, you know, a, you know, real estate type business where you're a service-based sales professional. And I think that applies to a lot of people. You know, the elephant in the industry is that, and this is almost every industry, but in real estate specifically, so many bad real estate agents and so many real estate agents fail. Right. And they get in and they they're not they can't successfully build a business. I'm really curious to get your opinion on today's times with the shift that's happening, um, you know, in the marketplace. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing it, but the iBuyer shifts and everything that's happening there, the EXPs that are coming in, all these things that are shifting around. What's your advice to a new agent starting out or an agent that's in the business right now of what they need to be focusing on? to grow their business and make sure they thrive now that we're in 2021 and going in beyond? I know that's a big question, but I'm curious to hear you guys' thoughts. Yeah, I would say, you know what? It's, it's never different. It's value. If you bring enough value to the world, you can't keep the money away. It's not possible. So focus on what you're going to give, not what you're going to get. Mm. And 
what value can you bring to people? Because the only way someone's going to agree to do business with you is uh, one, they have a value, what I like to call a value gap, and you're going to help them solve that. Right. And they believe you can help them solve that. That's really all they care about is, you know, what do I want to accomplish out of this? And and you've got to be the professional that can bring that value to them. And no, nothing else matters. You know, the competition doesn't matter what you know. None of that matters. You have to adjust to yeah, what's going on. Is it a seller's market or a buyer's market? But the truth is certain things in the 30 years I've been in the business have never changed. And, you know, I think it starts with you deciding who do you love helping? Because if you don't get up every day and love helping the people you're helping, it's, it's going to show through. People are going to see that, right? So you're, you picking who you want to be a hero to, and then you always working on what's my validity, what value, what validity do I have to even expect another human being to open a door to a relationship with me, mm. right? Because the most valuable asset is our time. And if I don't show value and my validity pretty quickly, they're not going to give me the time of day, right? So what am I always doing to grow my validity and my knowledge? And your validity could be your, like Dana said, your failures, your successes, your knowledge, um, everything, your knowledge of the market, um, your knowledge of how to solve their problems, you know, and help them through t- difficult situations that they're in right now, like 40 offers on one house. Uh, and then, you know, getting it, dropping into curiosity and asking great questions to find out what truly is of value to them. Cause we tend to assume we know what somebody wants and the best thing to do is ask them, you know, how do I win with you? How do I make this a 10 plus fantastic transaction for you? Get that stuff up front. And if it's not realistic and you can't do it, let them go up front. Right. But I think a lot of times uh, we don't focus on, you know, just wake up and add value and figure mm. out what people's value gaps are that you, you can help them solve. And I think you'll have more business than you could ever possibly have. I love that. I would agree with all of that. And I wrote down three quick little things I've set joked forever. I think real estate is the only business that you can wake up in the morning and you're at the height of heights and you can get one phone call and you're in the pits of hell in like 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> and then you get another one and you're like back up and then back to, I mean, it's like a true emotional roller coaster. Um, but I love the question because I think things are definitely different and they're changing at a rapid pace. I believe there's a lot of going back to the basics, like Linda said, and being about value. I think, um, Luke, I think you're right. A lot of realtors get a bad rap. Um, we call it uh, ones who they have commission breath. <laughs> um, it's all that they care about. And so I, the three things I wrote down is one, I think you still have to have a servant's heart. I tell agents all the time, if you don't have a servant's heart and you're not going to care about those clients more than you care about other things that are happening in your life, then you're not going to last long-term because it's too emotionally draining, to be honest. Um, and the second thing I wrote down right now specifically is, you have to tell your story. Um, I just posted something on Facebook last night about some of my market centers who had a really great month because if you don't tell your story, someone else will. And there are so the competition is so fierce right now. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's fierce in all industries, but it's especially fierce in real estate. And I think that sometimes realtors get busy in just the daily grind of stuff and they don't work, um, necessarily on their business because they're working in it and they're doing appraisals and the inspection. And this person, you know, has multiple offer and blah, 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 blah. Instead of really taking the time to work on your business, which leads me to the third thing. I just heard Gary Keller say a couple of weeks ago, um, you guys are, I think he probably said like nuts or idiots or something. If you don't believe this, he said, no business model is built to last forever. So so for me, agents right now, they have to be willing to pivot and change. If you are never going to learn technology, then you probably aren't going to last in real estate very much longer. If you aren't willing to change and adapt and come up with new ways to do business and what experiences are you creating for your clients so that they don't want to go to, you know, a discount brokerage, or they don't want to do their whole transaction through a Zillow or realtor.com or something like that. They want you to be belly to belly relation to relationship with them throughout the transaction. Um, but you know, I always tell people we do it. I mean, if you ask everybody, if they've ever bought anything from Amazon that they could have bought from their local store down the street, they're going to say yes. Mm -hmm. And they do it because it's convenient and they can do it from their sofa or bed or, you know, it's it's cheaper sometimes all those things. So we can't be ignorant to the fact that everybody wants convenience. If you can't do it from this, then you're not doing it. And so I just think agents have to be 
they have to have the mindset of they're going to have to make some changes. And unfortunately, a lot of them don't want to. And I think it's sad. Um, but those would be my three things. Yeah, uh, man, here. that's so good. I love how you attack it too, because what I would recommend and encourage the audience is when you wake up every day and you're focused on the value and you're focused on a servant's heart, and these are the true things you believe, making the phone calls becomes easier. Because well, you're you, yeah, you're helping. You're not trying to, you're not trying to, it's not like you're gamifying to where I have to call and I have to close this deal. Or I have to get this done or I have to, it becomes just like, Hey, I'm going to do what's best for my clients. And I'm going to add value today and change people's lives. And the result of that you have to believe will be the income that you want, the deals that you want, all that stuff. But I see so many agents struggle to do the activities that I know, you can't control the result, but you can tr- control your activities. That I know if you do these activities, you will have success, but they struggle because they don't have what you're talking about, which is a value centric business, a mindset of abundance versus a mindset of scarcity. And they end up getting on a hamster wheel. And it's it's really sad. And it's trying to encourage people that go, you know, look, if you just focus on giving, you'll have more. You'll have more than you ever, ever want. All right. So talk a little bit then about this idea of building wealth. Uh, So you guys are big, obviously, on this idea of building wealth. So I'd love to hear kind of your pointers to people, encouragement to real estate agents, non-real estate agents. What's your what's your thoughts process there? I get mine from Linda. So, Linda, do you take it away? (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, the real estate business is one that the last day you sell your last house is the last dollar you'll make. And I know that sounds simple, but I remember the day I woke up and realized that, you know, I was watching people. And just chasing the people that were doing more deals than me. And then I'd get to the more deals and I'd realize, well, what happened to so-and-so? And And they say, well, well, he quit and went back to school or, or, you know, or, and I'm like, wait, wait, we're headed there. I wanted to be headed somewhere amazing and with freedom and, you know, plenty of money to do the things that are important and all that stuff. And then we, I realized that unless you do something differently, you really have traded whatever job you gave up to get in the real estate business for a job. And so I think, you know, as realtors, we're so busy helping other people do those things that we have to wake up and say, look, I got a plan for 10, 15, 20 years from now. And if I'm doing this business, because a lot of people love doing it, honestly, when I ask them, how much longer do you see yourself doing this? They say forever. And I say, fantastic. But wouldn't it feel better if you do it forever because you want to, not because you have to, Mm. right? And so I think as realtors, we have to wake up. Well, everybody, I think COVID made the whole world wake up and be two more things be way more important than they used to be your health and your wealth. Right. So I'm not, you know, my husband was in the restaurant nightclub business before I got into real estate as a small business owner, we had the same problem. We weren't building wealth. We were building cash flow. And so I think everyone out there, no matter what your business is, you got to decide how much money you want coming in someday Uh, And you got to be doing the activities today to make that happen. And, you know, there's freedom is like one of the most important things to me. And so the only way to have freedom is have freedom of your time, money and your relationships. And you got to work on that now so you can get it later. Mm. I remember one time, it's one of the best things I've learned. I remember one time, you know, I was making great money and, and what was great money to me then at the time was really great. And, but I also felt like I had 95 jobs. And I remember Jimmy looked at me, Linda's husband one time, and he said, um, Dana, all that's great. And all that money's great, but all that is cash flow, and that's active income. None of it is passive and none of it is wealth building. I'm just hoarding all this cash for no reason. Um, and, and so it was interesting. And then he said one time he, Jimmy said, Linda, you probably remember this. I think these are the three things he said, everybody is wealthy. It's just, they're either wearing it, driving it, eating it. <laughs> uh, or <laughs> What we say is there's plenty of money to do investing but you are choosing to eat it, drink it, wear it, or live in it. Have it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're, it's about choices. And when those choices change, you'll have the money to do what you need to do. Or you'll find a resource that can do it with you that has the money. So good. I love that. You're either driving it, wearing it, eating it. I've never heard the <laughs> eating never, it before. The eating it is that. great. <laughs> Drinking it. <laughs> Something. No, that's amazing. So let's ask you guys. I mean, you guys are amazing. I could talk to you guys all day long. I can see why you have a podcast that's super successful and everything. Um, I would love to ask each of you. Josh and I are all about self-improvement, self-development, becoming the best version of yourself. And so we ask every guest on the show, when you look at your life, what are the routines that you have implemented that have actually produced for you that you go, man, I'm so glad I do that routine because I really have seen the dividends 
uh, from it. Go ahead, Dana. Okay. I'm trying to write down a couple. Okay. So a couple of routines, I would say, um, at least every month I put, have always done this. Linda does the same. I put myself in some sort of learning environment. It's been the best thing I could have ever have done. I'm super learning based. I take 900 pages of notes. I come back and go through all of them. And for me, um, you know, that might not be a, like a everyday morning routine, but it's a routine that has helped me make a lot of money, help a lot of other people and do a lot of things. I get in a rut when I'm not learning something new, uh, definitely. And someone once told me avoid, do everything you can to avoid getting in a rut. Cause it's hard as hell to get out of one. Um, and so definitely that would be number one. Number two, I would say I have learned over the last probably five or six years I need a routine of like sprint, 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 rest, sprint, 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 rest. Um, I can work nonstop 24 seven and that cannot be healthy for me, for relationships, for all of those things. So I do really try to make where at least once a quarter, I'm a week on vacation. I'm out, I'm doing something, even if it's a staycation and I'm just at home, like actually going to the dentist and doing laundry and things that we all need to do. Um, but that is a routine that over the last several years, has served me really well because it's just made me, it's forced me to want to take a minute to relax. Um, you know, one thing, Linda and I've talked about this on our podcast before, but sometimes when you're going so much, you lose the brain space that actually is where your creativity comes from. And so I found that if I keep that routine and actually do rest, um, and you know, you're not fully resting. It's not like you sleep for a week, but you, you let your mind calm down, which I just was on vacation last week. And it took me like three days to be able to just actually calm down and really act and really enjoy it. And then I had so many great ideas when I got home because my brain was free and I had some creative space. Mm, so um, true. But I would say just off the top of my head, those are probably two of the biggest ones for me. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, very good. I would say one of the best you know, first of all, I hate, I hate routine. Everybody knows <laughs> I go all over the place because I hate rigid schedules. So I've learned that about myself, but a couple of things that I've put into place that really have made a big difference for me is number one, I always pay attention to what gives me energy or what drains my energy. And if something drains my energy, it's not going to stay in my world very long. Uh, so that's been number one. Number two, um, if I'm not reaching a goal or something that I know is important, I'm knowledgeable enough. I've read up on it. I know it's important. Um, and the thing I think of is lifting weights. It's super important. Uh, I will go run three miles or four miles every day. No problem. Nobody has to hold me accountable. But as far as lifting weights, I have to have a system around making me do that, which means I pay someone else. They show up. I have no choice. Right. So if I've learned that if I'm not doing something, I'm missing a system or a person or something, right? I don't stay there very long. I figure out, okay, what's missing? Is it a person? Is it a system? Because I got to move this forward. This is too important. And then I've also learned that if I've got a value gap or something in my life that's not working, I, the first thing I ask myself is, okay, what validity do I need? Do I need more knowledge? Do I need more experience? What, what's missing for this to be a gap in my life? And then I ask, who are the people that can help me? Uh, Dana and I pick a word every year. My word this year is collaboration. Hmm. I love learning that everybody is not great at everything. And the more people, you said earlier, Luke, that people do the best when they're in their purpose. They do the best when they're in their purpose and when they're in their gift zone, hmm. when they are the things that are so easy for them that it look, they think it's easy for everyone else, you know, you will excel and they will excel. So and good. so really just saying, you know, what's, what's missing for me to fill this value gap, what relationships I'm a big go to other people, um, uh, and, and find the people that know the answers. And I don't waste any time doing that. If I don't know the answer to something, I'm going to go figure out the people that do, and then I'm going to get in a conversation with them or, you know, whatever I need to do to get those answers. So just learning that stuff as quick as possible. So you don't stay stuck. Time goes so fast and you don't want to waste it. It's the only, only precious commodity that we truly have. So that can't be replaced. Mm, I love that. I love the idea of leverage. I think the most successful people you see doing that. I read recently a story. Maybe you guys have heard this of like Henry Ford, whenever he was criticized for not knowing something, he's like, you see this button right here on my desk. I can click this button. And within minutes I can have any 
anyone come in here and give me the answers yeah. that I need to know. I don't need to know those things. So I love that. Uh, last question for you. I would love to, you know, knowing what you know now, this might get a little emotional. You have to go back a little bit, but knowing what you know now, what would you go back and tell your younger self? Oh, good question. Oh my gosh. Let's see. Young. She, what would you tell yourself yesterday? What would you tell yourself <laughs> yesterday, Dana? <laughs> no, every year I'm like getting really close to 40. Um, okay. Let's see. I think I would tell myself to just fail faster. I always, I want things to be perfect and I like for everything to just go a certain way and be perfect. And, and I think I've wasted a lot of previous years on not maybe moving as quickly because of a fear of it just not being perfect or of failing at it or something like that. And where I've learned my biggest lessons have been through the times that I have failed, (laughs) to be honest. And I think that as long as you like quickly recover from that failure, then it's good. Um, But I think I probably, I think I could have been a a further along if I would have just not worried about things being perfect. Mm. Yeah. And I think for me, um, I, I, I study under a guy named Dan Sullivan. You guys probably have heard of him because he's, he's been coaching entrepreneurs for 40 yeah. years. And one of the biggest ahas I had a couple of years ago in one of his sessions was a, a thinking form that he gave us. And when I saw the form, I realized that my life was as big as it is because I had actually followed this formula without realizing it. And the formula is go make big, scary commitments. Mm -hmm. I mean, ones that are so scary, you know, he likes to say the difference between fear and courage is fears where you just wet your pants because of that commitment you just made and courage is where you go ahead and do the commitment with the wet pants. Right. And, uh, (laughs) the reason it takes courage is because these commitments are so big. You don't ever have the credentials to pull them off when you first make it. Right. So you hurry and get those credentials because nobody likes this scary place called courage. And then you get this amazing thing called confidence. Well, the problem is the more you do that, there's a fifth place that you can go to called complacency. And I would tell my younger self, go find the scariest commitments you can make, make them as fast as you can, and don't stop. Keep finding the next one to make it. Because I think we spend a lot of time after we've accomplished something big thinking, whew, man, I made that out alive, whew. but not realizing, okay, but how, how fast can I go find another big, scary commitment? Because it's through that process that you wind up and you look up one day and you go, man, I have an amazing big life. And I have it because without even realizing it, I was making big, scary commitments. And it ties into a little bit what Dana said, because it's real, it's real scary to do those things because failure is an option and, you know, all that stuff that we worry about. So I would say do more of the big, scary commitments and don't stop. Keep doing them and see how big your life can really be. That's awesome. Great yeah. advice. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you both for being here. Yeah, really awesome. appreciated this. Uh, please, before we close out, let people know how they can connect with you, uh, follow you on Instagram, find your podcast, all that good stuff. Perfect. Yep. Um, we're just at everything life and real estate on Instagram. Linda also is just Linda McKissick. I'm Dana Gentry on Instagram. Um, and then we have a website, everything life and real estate.com. You can connect with us there and any questions, uh, email at, is info at everything life and real estate.com. We're sticking with the theme, our branding. <laughs> love it. Love it. We're going to include all of those links in the show notes of this episode that you can get over at staypaidpodcast.com as well as the video. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you're looking for ways to support the show, there's two ways we ask you to do that. First is to head on over to Apple Podcasts, drop us a five-star rating along with a comment, letting us know what you thought about this video. And the best way to help out is just to tell a friend, share this episode with somebody you know that needs to hear it. If you want to get hold of me or Luke, you can email us at podcast at reminder media dot com and of course you can find us on instagram we're at stay paid podcast for this episode of stay paid i'm joshua stike guys and i'm luke acre what an amazing interview is awesome i hope we can have you guys back i think there's so much more we can go so much deeper we can go to on so many different levels but i think the action item that i want to give everyone who's listening to this because we want you to take something and put it into action and there's so many good things that have been said but i think one of the best is hey what is that three year journey for you? What is that five-year journey, that purpose that you're trying to get to, right? What is that? And if you lead people, do you know that for the people that you lead? Like ask yourself that question. Cause I was asking myself that question as I was just thinking when they were sharing it on the podcast is, Wait, where do, I, do I know the five-year vision of all the people that I lead? So if you lead somebody, that's an action item for you to do. You can literally start executing on that. 
everybody is a leader, just so you know. So everybody is leading. But if you're thinking, hey, I don't have direct reports or something like that, well, get clear on your five-year vision, what you're trying to accomplish, because then you can apply so many of the truths of you're not waking up to just get commission breath and close the next transaction. You have a purpose, you have a journey and a place you're going towards. Remember this, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in every single industry Josh and I have worked in is top producers take action. Take action on that today. 